Hello and welcome to the Managing Magic Podcast. This is Kian Sobani with a quick primer for today's show. It is a two-parter. Part one is Lucas Navarrete and I reacting in real time to today's breaking news about the report that El Chiringuito threatened Vinicius Jr. about posting that video. And if he were to do it, they were going to go on a smear campaign of him. And then just as we were about to hit record, Vinicius' agent texts me and denied the whole thing, that it wasn't true. And Lucas and I reported on the website quickly. We reacted in real time. So here is the conversation basically that we had. And you get to hear in real time. We also stuck around at the end, also just in time for Pedro's Twitch to get underway and also to uh, get his quotes out. So that's part one. And then part two is Castilla Corner with Ruben Skierping and Christopher McCormick. They are going to go over some notes from the weekend. Iker Bravo, Arribas, and a bunch of other things. So enjoy it. Let's get started with Derek Ray and Ray Hudson. Let's go. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website first rate podcast as well of course Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation hello and welcome to a Tuesday edition of the Managing Madrid podcast I'm your host Kian Sobani it is currently seven almost seven o'clock in Madrid and Lucas and I just had like a good half hour. We were supposed to record half hour ago and then this whole Vinicius thing came and we were dealing with that for 30 minutes because we had to publish it really quick before the podcast started. And and while we were publishing it, we got word from Vinicius' agent that the story wasn't true. And then we had to kind of rewrite, but then publish two different articles explaining one and the other. And, and now we're here and we're trying to make sense of it all. And you're going to make sense of it with us live in real time. So Lucas, welcome to the show. How you doing? Hey. Hey, Kian, thanks for having me. And it seems that we did some some of this uh, co-working, which seems to be a trend now. <laughs> we edited uh, a piece together and all that. It was uh, it was good for, for this, 20, this last 20, 25 minutes, this co-working thing. We got a taste of it. Well, it was kind of, we got lucky in the sense that we were just meeting on Zoom by chance as this was breaking. So we were able to just talk about it quickly in person or face-to-face rather. And, and get the story done. So why don't we, I guess we can update the listeners on what the heck we're talking about in case they haven't heard it yet. And I think this podcast will go up in a couple more hours. So um, by then you should have heard it by now, but we'll just kind of explain what's going on. Do you want to explain how the news initially broke and what it was? Well, sure. Initially, obviously, after the whole uh, coke controversy, the the, the the coke comments, which were not as harmful as, as the other comments we will later discuss, but after the Coke comments, obviously a big uh, discussion in El Chiringuito uh, last week, pre-derby, we were talking about pre-match. Uh, and one member of El Chiringuito, Pedro Bravo, who is the president of the, of, uh, the Spanish agents, uh, Football Agents Association, I believe, made a, a despicable comment about uh, Vinicius, saying that Vinicius um, should stop doing the monkey and should take his samba back to Brazil. To be fair, as a Spanish speaker, uh, the first comment saying that Vinicius should stop doing the monkey isn't uh, like it's an expression meant to say, meant to to tell someone to stop fooling around, to stop being a fool. Obviously, it's still completely inappropriate, and, and context is what matters here. And this is an expression that he shouldn't be saying for sure. And Vinicius obviously got very upset with this, rightfully so published a video on his social media uh, about this uh, racism, racist abuse that he received and how society needs to change and how the Spanish society is treating him differently because he's a kid from Brazil, a young kid from Brazil having success in Europe and all that. Obviously, the game happened. Then El Chiringuito apologized after, after the game on their show on Sunday, saying that the comment wasn't meant to be racist and that... Uh, but still apologizing if anyone was offended. And then today, uh, Tuesday, uh, YouTube uh, YouTuber uh, Iñaki Angulo 
published a video saying that Vinicius' uh, camp, Vinicius' is in Turrets staff, if you will, uh, received pressure from El Chiringuito about not publishing uh, this video, about not going ahead and publishing this video, uh, threatening him to treat him like, uh, to quote-unquote, destroy him on their shows, like criticizing uh, and all that. Uh, everyone went mm, quite crazy and rightfully so after this uh, report from Iñaki Angulo, then ESPN Brazil confirmed it. But uh, Kijan got word from Vinicius's agent uh, Federico Peña. Pena, sorry, I don't, I don't know if that, if that N is an, is an N or not. But anyway, saying that the report is 100% uh, false. And this is where we're at at the moment. This uh, is obviously a big controversy. One could think that the, ES, the, the ESPN Brazil report should be accurate and should know about the whole situation. But our word, the word we, we received, Kijan received from Vinicius's agent says that uh, Vinicius or his staff and, and close uh, friends did not receive this pressure. So this is, this is where, where we're at at the moment. So this one, I got to admit, when I saw this initial story, it's an extremely believable story. And I think a lot of people wanted it to be true in the sense that I think a lot of people just want to take that show down. And I obviously I have no um, problem with El Chiringuito getting bad press at this point, if I'm being quite honest with you. I, I, it's kind of being just me being transparent. It's a, it's a show that's been causing a lot of vitriol in the past few days, to put it bluntly and, and, and minimally. Um, but I, I think, and, and so when, when Vinicius' agent texted me that, I was a little bit surprised. I really wasn't expecting it necessarily to be false. And, you know, he reiterated multiple times, 100% false, false, 100% false. And where did it come from? His theory was social media news. Obviously, the problem is that it's been repeated. It's been reported by people who are bigger than social media noise. So, you know, take it for what you will. So whatever reasons there were for this story coming out for people who are doing good work, I would say, in my opinion, although I, I'm not that close with Iñaki Angulo's work, but anytime I've come across him, he seems like he does good work. So where it stems from, I'm not entirely sure, and Vinicius' agent doesn't. But... You know, our job is to report what we know. And when it comes from the horse's mouth, it comes from the horse's mouth. And so we are just uh, passing along the message. So um, I don't know. Is there, is, was there anything else that, that needed to be said about this? I, I always had one big question about uh, Angulo's report. Yeah. As I told you before we hit record. And that question was, how did they know Benefis was going to publish something? Like Vinicius telling them doesn't make any doesn't make any sense to me. If yeah. he was rightfully offended by the by the by the comments, it doesn't make sense to me. Vinicius warning El Chiringuito that he was going to publish something about the ra the racist abuse he received. It doesn't make any any sense whatsoever to me. So El Chiringuito going to Vinicius's camp. Telling the, telling them not to publish not to publish the video ahead of him publishing the video makes no makes no sense to me something something is lost there it's some uh, something doesn't make sense to me there it's just there's if the reports actually said they told uh, I don't know they tried to tell him to take the video down in the to 10 minutes that followed after Vinicius just uh, tweeted the video, something like that, it would make more sense to me. But the timeline of the, the report from Angulo doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't, the only possible explanation would be that, yes, Vinicius told El Chiringuito that he was going to publish the video and El Chiringuito reacted and said, no, don't do it. But to me, it doesn't make any sense to see Vinicius warning El Chiringuito about that thing. That's a question that I definitely had in my mind subconsciously. Like it entered my mind at some point that like, how would they know? Like did Vinicius approach them and say, hey, this is what you've done. Now I'm going to release this video. Or was it maybe someone at the club found out and the club said, told them, you know, this is what Vinicius is planning to do. 
those are all questions I would have in that situation. I, I don't know necessarily how that would go down. <clears throat> so that it would be interesting to know if that, you know, were true, how they would have found out and how that approach would have been taken. I don't know. I certainly don't think, in ter- as far as incentives go, I don't think Vinicius's agent or Vinicius's camp would have incentive to lie ever, but particularly lie about this and say they did not threaten me. Um, the only, but here's what I will say. Well, I I, I don't know actually. I, I was going to say something, but I think I, I quickly counted myself in my mind and and kind of canceled it out. But you know, if if it were true, I think I, I don't think, or maybe they just want to deal with it in a different way. Maybe they want to deal with it behind the scenes in a legal matter. I'm not sure, but certainly you know. When it's denied by the person who is the guy who's been um, under heavy, the the victim and, and direct abuse and racism in the last few days, if 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 he says it wasn't true, then then I I tend to believe that side of the story is what I'll say. Yeah, it's the same. Obviously, you have uh, when we have word from the agent, it's uh it's something very. That it's something that at least we needs to be published. This is word from the agent, and maybe there's a side here that the agent is not that close to Vinicius and Vinicius' camp, and maybe he doesn't know about this pressure because the player hasn't told him about it. But uh, to me, it, it's and to, to that, that to that, what I will say: well, he's the freaking agent, so he would. And and two, if if that were the case where he he was not being informed by the player. Then in that case, I don't think he would, instead of responding immediately and finding out, vehemently saying no, 100% false, false, 100%. That's, 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 that's the counter I would have to that. That's so true, again, so true. this is, I, I would say like the, what the listeners are listening to now or watching on YouTube or wherever you're, you're consuming this, you're kind of experiencing me and Lucas also just talking about this raw form and just trying to make sense of it. Again, we're reporting what was handed to us and trying to make sense of that conflicting with an initial report from earlier today so it's you know it, it's it's interesting and kind of this is why sometimes i don't get into the sources game that much because it can be tr- tricky to navigate um but this is i guess i guess the reality I, I don't really know if there's any other angles necessarily to um to tackle this from but i will say the other reason why i thought it was believable was because again the last few days it's not like it's been favorable towards Vinicius there's also been a few tweets um today I think that that are not very favorable towards Vinicius so um maybe maybe someone maybe whoever wanted this story out and obviously we know who put this story out just did not like those tweets or did not like where they were coming from or was just informed by someone who did not like those tweets and where they were coming from either I don't know I don't yeah, have we don't, sense. we don't know. Quite possibly, nobody other than than Vinicius knows exactly what happened here. Not Angulo, not ESPN Brazil, not El Chiringuito, even maybe, or at least maybe I have to assume Pedrerol does know. But and this is just a matter of who you want to believe and what side of the story you want to believe, or not, not even want to believe, because I. I'm seeing many fans wanting to believe Iñaki Angulo's report because they obviously hate El Chiringuito and how they treat, not how they treat Madrid, but how they cover football in general. But, you know, the truth is the truth. And, and when when we hear the word from, from the agent, that that's something that needs to be reported in, in, in such a special circumstance, such a special case. Even if the agent were to be wrong, or where to deny the report because he he would rather see things handled on a court of justice rather than on social media or in reports. That's an entire different discussion. But definitely, he's you know if he denied us the, that version that report, this is something that needs to be reported. I'm sure you headed into this podcast thinking about. You had all these things prepared for talk about the game that happened on Sunday night, right? <laughs> yeah, well, obviously it was. Uh, I didn't expect it to take this kind of turn. Yeah. Well, what, what did you want to talk about from the game itself? Did you have any lingering thoughts from it? Well, 
I wasn't pleased with uh, with the the last stage of the of the game, the last 15, 20 minutes. I thought Real Madrid could have lost uh, those three points they earned in pretty comfortable fashion during the first few portions uh, of the game. I thought the team uh, pretty much uh, gave up and, uh, and, and and not gave up because they were winning, but you know you know what I'm saying. Quit playing, quit trying. To, to score or, or to harm Atletico and Madrid like pretty much during the entire second half. And that pretty much costed, uh, that uh, could have costed the, the team a lot uh, in the last few minutes, especially after that considered unfortunate goal. Uh, but luckily enough, Real Madrid obviously walked away with, with those three points. And uh, I think the main talking point, not to, not to uh, copy or or not to replicate what El Chiringuito have been doing for the last few days or so. I think that the main talking point should still be Vinicius and, uh, and the things we, we, we discussed last week in the, in the sense that I don't think this kind of pressure, this kind of spotlight, this kind of uh, frustration or animosity helps him uh, in his game. I think that he's a much better player when... <laughs> When he's a composed figure and not trying to too hard to to make the the highlight play or, or or the goal, if you will. Well, you know the story I, to me was still from you know, and I because Diego and I recorded a podcast earlier today that hasn't been published yet as the time we're talking, but uh, we just spent so much time talking again like about the whole racism side of it, which I thought was the bigger story from that night. Absolutely. But I will. I mentioned this in passing to you and on Sunday when we were recording that uh, I don't think it should be expected of him, and I think it would be almost unreasonable to, because like you know to go through what he went through, but then also have to perform on a huge derby stage with in a hostile atmosphere is freaking hard. Absolutely. Um. So and I don't if like if he didn't live up to that, I would not even fault him for it, right? Absolutely. But I, you know, I thought his mentality was pretty strong I, I you know was there a point in the second half where maybe the rainbow flick didn't get pulled off yeah sure um if it gets pulled off it's going it's going viral and it's genius and if it doesn't it it, it obviously looks pretty pat it's like a panenka penalty right if it gets pulled off it's genius if it's not it's the worst idea you've ever had in your life but you know one one quick thing about the what's the name of the of that particular play in english sorry i don't i don't know how to translate the I, I believe it's it? a rainbow flick i think yeah whatever okay the lambreta it's called here in spain or whatever the the thing i hate hate the thing i dislike the most about Vinicius trying to pull this off is the fact that i think the game was over the game was in the fritz the fans were not even trying to encourage atletico and madrid to go after the win and he got the fans fired up and maybe even the players because you know it was uncalled for we can, I think, we all like Vinicius, but that rain, rainbow flick was unnecessary, right? I mean, we can all agree on that. It, it was not a necessary uh, dribble to dribble past opponents. I mean, to help, to help defenders were there to get the ball away from him. Like, he was going nowhere with that rainbow flick, right? He, I, to me, it was showboating. I mean, I think we can pretty much all agree on this. I don't like this part of Vinicius, but the mo- the thing I dislike the most about this rainbow flick is the fact that I th- I didn't think, I don't think it was a smart play of football. I think Real Madrid had business taken care of. I think that Atletico were not even trying. I think that the fans were not even expecting Atletico to try. I think the fans were already leaving the stadium, to be fair. And all of a sudden, the, the spark got there. You know, the spark got lighted up. And the fans started to cheer. The fans wanted blood. The fans wanted revenge. One an Atletico started attacking a bit more. They started they started to get it fired up. So it was not a smart play to do from Vinicius in at the at the Metropolitano. I don't think if you do that in front of your home fans, I might I, I may dislike it, but not definitely as much as as doing it in front of uh, of fans who want revenge, especially when business has been taken care of already. I think it's yeah, like I I don't dispute what you're saying. I think it's one of those things where, um, like, 
in terms of smart football plays, like when you're what you're rehearsing and training, like you know, point A to point B, this is what you do, this is how you play, this is how you keep possession, these are the passing triangles, this is how we keep the ball, this is how we create efficient chances. That's definitely not in the playbook, right? That's not something that is they're being told to do in training. However, I think and this is where Ancelotti's management I think comes in. Absolutely. Is that I think you I think Ancelotti himself has actually been vocal about the fact that, you know, Vinicius, you know, we he could have some better decision making. I don't I'm paraphrasing now because I don't remember exactly what the wording was, but you know what I'm talking about. He's hinted at that stuff. He before, made right? that, yeah. Yeah. Um at the same time I think he's also pretty smart about the fact where things like, you know, when someone asks him what do you what do you tell Modric in a game like this and he says, Who am I to tell Modric? I think he also has that side of his management where he says Express yourself. And I think you you may like not get the full Vinicius experience if you don't also let him have some kind of leash with this stuff and and let him make a couple of mistakes a game like that. Um, but I also I asked this question to you, and although I don't even know if he answered me because it was because I think I just kept talking instead of letting him answer. But do you <laughs> think like do you think the 30 year old Vinicius tries that? Or do you think Probably it's a, just a different he has a different way of playing? Probably not, yeah. The Brazilian players tend to mature uh, very early and decline very early, mind you. It's, you know, it's the way, their way of, uh, of life. And uh, to me, it's, it's, it, it, the answer is probably not. The answer is probably no. Um, having said that, you know what happens if he pulls that off? Like, it would just, the internet would break. It would be like... It would be like, man, remember that day when Vinicius went in and he was met with racism and he was so badass right. and he did the rainbow flick and then he right. basically owned everyone. I mean, look, he doesn't have to prove that to anyone. Again, I'm not saying like I would just be like this cherry on top or like we would just would never stop talking about it. It was like I think it was like it wasn't that high of a risk reward trade off. It was two nil at that point. Right. I hope it wasn't two one. If it was two nil, two nil, two nil, two nil, you know, I'll, I guess I'll allow. But I, I definitely understand your point. Yeah. Just for the sake of his physical condition, even even if you trust your defense to t- to take the game home and take the three points, with uh with the fans fired up, with the players fired up for ten minutes, even if that, just for the sake of you know, Felipe not trying to break your leg in the second uh, Madrid derby of the season where Atletico have nothing to play for, right? Maybe you are in the semifinals, in the quarter finals of the of, of the Champions League. Atletico have nothing, literally nothing to play for because they have already clinched or secured their presence in next year's Champions League. They visit the Bernabeu and maybe Felipe tries to break Vinicius' leg. I mean, this is football and this is and this is something likely. Uh, okay, you try this on me now. This is the this is the bill we I got for you. you the, the game was over at, at the Metropolitano. You tried to embarrass and, and humiliate us. And now you want to play in the current finals or the semifinals of the Champions League. You still have to play and, and, and compete for La Liga. Here's what I got for you. Remember what you did in September? Here's what I got for you. You need to be smart, I think, Ian. Um, You know, like, context is everything, too. Like, if he does that in the Champions League final and you're up 2-0 and you don't pull it off and then all of a sudden the other team comes back and wins, that's <laughs> going to be circled, you know, on your career. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, we're just talking about theoreticals now. Yeah, it would like I think I think it's safe to assume Vinicius will keep polishing his game just based on the fact that we've seen him polish his game so much over the past three years. Like everything we said every year, every summer, like he needs to work on this. He's, he's added done. that to his toolbox every summer. Come back with it stronger, better, new weapons. And Rodrigo is doing the same thing now. I mean, Fede, Fede is doing it right now. Fede Absolutely. is just coming back like as a complete machine, and he already was. It's 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 really see, awesome like, to see. Obviously, he wasn't in the spotlight. I was going to say as much as Vinicius, but he wasn't in the spotlight at all. Rodrigo, I'm talking about. I like Rodrigo's attitude way better than than Vinicius in in this game. He was <clears> composed, <throat> and still danced when he had to dance. I still sent the message when the message needed to be sent. And at the same time, focus on doing the right play every single time. Obviously, I have to uh, accept and acknowledge the fact that, again, he wasn't uh, as scrutinized or under as big of a pressure as Vinicius was. But 
I like his his character inside the 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 field. I like Rodrigo's a little bit more. I don't know. I, to be honest, I didn't. What's your take on the tweets on Vinicius's tweets after the game? Uh, what what were they specifically? Because I remember all the pregame stuff. I don't. You no, know, no. I don't. I don't really do well on social media when it comes to all this. Right. He just basically uh, retweeted people uh, who were uh, quoting uh, these famous Real Madrid songs about uh, Atletico are losing the finals. They are crying again. About oh, did he really? Finals. Yeah. He was uh, engaging in that kind of conversation right after a game. I don't know. I don't know. On one part of me, my, my fan side of things, uh, my, my fan perspective enjoys obviously a player trying to uh, embarrass Atletico and Madrid fans a little bit after such a controversial week after such uh, controversial quotes from from Coque and obviously despicable uh, uh, songs to Vinicius pre-game one part of me enjoys those tweets and another one tells me that again it's not the smart thing to do it's not the smart thing to do if you actually value <laughs> and have a if you, if you actually value your body and your physical condition. It's, uh, th- these guys, I, I I fear that some defenders and not only Atletico Madrid defenders will, uh, as we say in Spain, will uh, will give Benitez the bill when it come, when when time comes. You know what I'm saying? Like revenge will come for them. I I fear that. I'm not saying that they will. I fear that. I I certainly like don't think partaking in all that stuff is something he needs to do. I'll definitely say that. Like it's 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 off field distractions. There's definitely I'm sure like he really reveled and enjoyed that aspect of it. To some degree, you know, he was probably really enjoying the fact that Real Madrid won. As we will all do. He played. He played well. He nearly scored. His goal led to uh, Fede's goal. He got to do the the awesome dancing celebration with Rodrigo, who scored. He would. He reveled in it. I do think at some point that probably becomes a distraction if he just if he's on social media after the game just doing that all game. But and a danger to his body. That's my main concern, to be honest. My main concern is that Felipe uh, Raillo from Mallorca the other day, who was having beef with him on field, will visit again. Will visit the Bernabeu in five months' time, and will say, "Okay, now is our time to show you uh, who the boss is when things are not going your way. We have nothing to play for. I don't care about missing two games with a with a red card." You are going to miss more than than those two games. Here's my thing. Yeah, the safety aspect of it is something I'm always worried about, because you can't control who's going to hold the grudge, who's going to just really not like the fact that you you're doing what you're doing. And again, obviously, not saying that that would be right to go in and injure him. No, but no, absolutely not. We've 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 just you know we've seen it. Like so. I, obviously, I worry about his health, and 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 even if it's not malicious, just the fact that he is the only way people can literally stop him at times is because is is just to basically take him down, just like they, the way they do, they did with Neymar. Yeah, to be fair, I I don't have a problem with Vinicius trying to pull these magic dribbles off when it's the right play to do, when it's you know when it's something that it's out there for him to succeed in a dribble. Like when it's a creative way of beating an opponent uh, and helping his team, the rainbow flick is not that part of. Uh, it's not a part of what I'm saying. I don't think it was. I don't think it was. I think some of the stuff he did against Mallorca in the first half isn't the right play or isn't the right way of beating an opponent either. Like he, he was so as you said the other day, he was always going to give that ball to Valverde, who was open for ages, and still wanted to not make another opponent. Like you could have passed it to Valverde way earlier, and there are still 70 minutes to be played, and you are going to face these defenders for 70 more minutes. And again, I'm not saying that they would be right in taking revenge. But I fear they they will at least want to 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 take uh, and earn 
this revenge on Vinicius when when they face him. I'm not even saying this season. I don't know. Two years time, three years time. Over the next over the next few months, years. We'll see. Uh, I mean, so far, so good. So far, he hasn't. Yeah. You know, he's been. He's he's also very good at just. Oh, he's at, been Madrid MVP for sure. Yeah, he's just very good at also evading challenges. I'm mean, even in this heated yeah. Atletico game. In the second half, like you know, I think it was a couple sequences before the rainbow flick attempt. There was one where he was just turning Marcos Llorente in and out and just basically just bouncing off his challenges. It was, it was incredible to watch. Yeah. I have one more thing to add. I didn't like uh, the way he dove uh, during the second half to try to get who was it? Hermoso. Yeah. I don't Maybe. know. Who... I don't know who can't it was remember. To, to pretend that the Atletico defender had elbowed him in the face. Come on. And like, I know this is a general um, thing footballers tend to do. At least some footballers in European football tend to go for these kind of chances. I'm not saying Vinicius is the only one doing it for sure. I mean, pretty much every single team has four or five players who tend to do these kinds of things, trying to get the opposition a yellow, uh, red card. But since we're talking about Vinicius and Vinicius' uh, moves slash antics in the derby, that's the uh, the other one thing that I didn't enjoy about him in, in the derby. I still haven't seen that replay, but again, I was in the stadium, so I, I didn't see it. Um, but Ewan said the same thing you did, that like, you know, that those that aspect of his game, he he definitely needs to... Yeah. Refine. You know, yeah. on, on some level, I, I, I understand why he does it is because... You just want to get the attention of the referee in general, but at the same time, you will also lose the trust of the referee. I think exactly. if you if you do it a lot as well. Exactly. Um, all right, so I think we squeezed half an hour out of this very strange news day. <laughs> do we anything else? I but I got another text from his agent explaining why he thinks that this story went out, but. I'll that I'll save that for off air to tell right. you. It's funny. I will I will uh, I will <laughs> tell you or report in this podcast that Josep Pedrol has gone live on on tweets on El Chiringuito's tweet. All and right. his quote is it's lie, it's it's not true, it's false that we have threatened Vinicius. That's the quote uh, that uh, El Chiringuito have gone for. I he never thought it, I'd be sitting here today saying the same thing as Jose Pedro. Hold on, hold on. It, it goes it goes even it goes even farther. He says that they're going they're getting ready to go on court uh, against uh, the Iñaki Angulo, the reporter who called them uh, mafia members. He said in, in El Chiringuito we do reporting at the uh, well. Uh, he said that the reporters or the journalists who are here are the best in Spain, and you know that. That's obviously his side of the story. But uh, he said <laughs> there are no here. No, that's he said that there are lies that we cannot um, consent. Here, consent. Uh, I guess is the right word. We should. We usually don't uh, reply to certain campaigns, but there are limits here. But basically, the most important thing about it all is that they're getting ready to go on court against uh, the reporter, against against Iñaki Angulo, saying that uh, it's also false that they have threatened Vinicius. So right now, it seems to it seems to me that uh, <laughs> Pedrerol is, is, has the same information that uh, Vinicius, than Vinicius. <laughs> <laughs> man, can, I'm I don't want to be a journalist anymore, man. I. That, let's just go. You want to go play ball? Let's go play basketball. Let's just reti- <laughs> let's just go play basketball and we'll get a farm. <laughs> we'll have our own animals. We'll have we'll grow our own food. Yeah. We'll grow beards. We don't need to do this <laughs> journalism. People going to court. People lying. Racism. Go on court. That, on that, farm. That's some. That's some, that's some serious <laughs> stuff there. Well, uh, alternatively, Lucas, I could have, you know, I, now I'm just glad that, you know, Vinicius' agent was like 100% false, 100% false on text, like adamant, like not even like, uh, do what you want, 100% false, 100% false. Yes, use my name. <laughs> it's like, so, all right. That was a good, I th- look, we got lucky with timing today for our podcast. We were supposed to record yesterday. Because we recorded today, this yeah. and then at the time we recorded, plus the time we finished at, we also got this news from you about what Pedro said on Twitch. <laughs> exactly. And then I'm done. I don't. Yeah. You know, none of this. None of this. I don't like drama. I don't like this side of the reporting. I just want to talk about yeah. football. So. 
Yeah, exactly. Now we got, but yeah, international break is uh, is a whole different beast. Yeah, it's, it's pure drama. <laughs> can you can you imagine uh, Real Madrid leaking this stuff out so that reporters, Real Madrid reporters, uh, get some uh, got something to talk about during these fifteen days, <laughs> and Real Madrid are all sitting under other tables laughing at. <laughs> Look at these guys fighting and going on court for something we made up so that they are entertained and our fans are entertained with something for these two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, this is the reality of the news cycle. So, yeah, it is what it is. By the way, uh, there's a unbelievably massive Iñaki Angulo army in my mentions right now. Whoa. Uh, it's not pretty. So, nope. uh, yeah, they're just so, but hey. I can imagine. <laughs> this is good This is good PR for me, I guess. It's like, you know, all, now all, all the Spanish people now all of a sudden know about me or, or uh, yeah, so I, I'm on the radar, I guess. I don't know what what happened. I don't know what's going on, man. This is a, this is a lot. A lot is happening right now. Uh, all right. Um, well, either way, thanks, Lucas. Appreciate Thank your you time. Appreciate no you problem. as always. We'll be back Thursday for the mailbag. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you. Enjoy. You Take care. Bye bye. Hello, hola, bonjour. Welcome to another episode of Castilla Corner. Uh, it is me, Christopher, and my good friend Ruben on the line, as always. Hello. We are joined after a really good game against San Sebastian de los Reyes. Off the bat, I can tell you that I haven't seen the whole game. I've seen the highlights, which in this case, a 5-1 win might actually just be enough to do a part. <laughs> <laughs> but you have seen the entire game, Ruben. Yes. So we have one guy who knows what he's talking about for sure. <laughs> Uh, I don't know where to start. Well, it's um, I actually watched. Um, I started the um, the week by watching the Juvenila in the youth league. Actually, so uh, a couple of players there, interesting. Uh, Iker Bravo and Minis Tobias both started there, and uh, I haven't been hugely impressed by them so far uh, for Castilla, but they. Um, they obviously perform better against other under-19 players. Um, and uh, I think it continued into this game. And uh, Iker Bravo scored his first goal, which I think a lot of people will be interested in hearing. Um, nicely taken goal. Um, assist from Arribas, of course. Yeah, and, um, I thought that that particular, the pass from Arribas was really good because he got he, the ball wasn't perfectly played to him. He had to get it out from under his feet. Yeah. So I don't know. I think I definitely give a rebass a fair a fair hand in that goal. It was just up to Bravo to put it in the back of the net. Definitely. So good performance by both of them. Arribas with the assist and uh, yeah, nice first touch and calm composed from Ike Bravo. And uh, I think that's important for him to get his first goal, especially with Alvaro Rodriguez out. He was not fit for this game. So. Um, I mean, I'm still kind of learning what kind of player uh, Ike Bravo is. And uh, it seems like he can do a lot of things. He, he He's good with his back to the goal. He's good in the link of play. He um, seems to be winning a lot of aerial duels. Um, if he's a good finish as well, well, he's technically good. I think, yeah, looks promising. Just 17. And uh, that's a good age for uh, you know, already playing at this level. Yeah, for sure. Um, who was it? Pablo Ramon scored that the own goal. Oh, the own goal that was uh, Rafa Marine. <laughs> it was very uh, like it was a bit bizarre. It kind of looked like he was trying to kick it out and over the goal. Yes. Instead of like trying to get behind it and kick it out field. Yeah, that was that was weird, very weird. It was like first it was Marvel who tried to dribble out and you just messed it up. And then San Sebastian fired off a kind of a weak shot, and you would expect Rafa Marin to clear it, but he just kicked it into the his own net instead. <laughs> so it was uh, kind of a weird goal. Do you th- is, is it an own goal though? Do you think it's an own goal? Um, I don't know. I'd have to. Do, I mean, because in my eyes, for sure. Going, yeah, it's because it's going against the goal. So in that case. Uh, I don't think that in a, per definition it's an own goal, but it, he does kick it into his own net. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I think like by definition they say like if it isn't 
going into the goal before the player gets a touch, then um, yeah, it's an own goal. But I, I yeah, not sure. I think uh, Rafa Marine played such a big part in getting it in the net that it, he might be an exception <laughs> to the rule in this case. Yeah. <laughs> I I think so too. It's a good point because if you actually you are the one kicking it into the net, I mean, yeah, you put it in the top corner. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good finish, but. Uh, yeah, it was um, a bit clumsy, and uh, so both of the first goals for Castilla and for San Sebastian were individual mistakes. Mm. And I've been thinking about we've been um, criticizing Castilla and Raúl for their defending, and especially Raúl, ah, oh, he needs to organize better, and maybe he needs to uh, throw more defensive players on the pitch, blah blah blah. But if these are the kind of goals you concede with individual mistakes, it's difficult to, to fix it as a coach. It's not yeah, about for sure. organizing it if the player does something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose with the criticisms towards the defense, we've always I think we've been pretty focused on the set pieces. Yeah. Which um I think the coach plays a big role in in effectively defending those. And we actually turned it around uh, the other way when, <laughs> when it comes to the set pieces in this yeah. game because uh, uh, 2-1 scored, corner kick by Peter Federico. And Marvel, who was the one who messed it up and lost the ball on the, on the goal Castilla conceded, he now gets the opportunity to score, but he misses the ball completely. And therefore, he surprises the defender, hits the defender, goes in. And this is definitely an own goal. So... Um, yeah, it was another another weird goal, but actually a set piece goal for Castilla. Castilla scored a set piece goal. That's they scored uh, two. Yeah, because uh, Rafa Marine got the third one as well. He did. Yeah, he it did. was weird. I think um, in terms of like that second one, Marine's goal. I think again, you have to give your hat off, put your hat off to a rebus or the free kick deliver, anyways. Because I it think was it was Alvaro ex- Martin actually. Yeah. yeah. It was an excellent delivery. Really, yes. really good. Yes, that was... Uh, I can understand why you would think it's Arribas, because it was a small guy with left foot. And, yeah, uh, you just presume. <laughs> so, Alvaro Martin started on the left in this game, and uh, I don't know that much about him. He's one of the Castilla players who I am not... You know, it would be more difficult to, to describe, but um, he... I, don't, I do think he offers a little bit more balance to the team and maybe that was important uh, to keep a little bit more a better defensive performance Castilla did improve a little bit this time in defense and uh, yes they conceded a goal but uh, it was not like a horror show which we have seen before luckily no no it was um, I think you could forgive the mistake especially since it didn't cost us anything in the end yes yes and um, and then four one Castilla uh, again Arribas gets his goal and uh, that's a brilliant pass from Dotor with his, the outside of his boot counter attack and Arribas chips the goalkeeper one on one and just in twenty minutes Castilla go from one one to four one and uh, you know Arribas he had actually wasted quite a lot of chances. But a lot of people say that this was maybe Arribas' best game ever for Castilla because he was just insane. He was insane. And he, he sometimes when Arribas starts dribbling, I just think, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. It's not possible. And then he just glides through yeah. the defenders. And uh, he's just... And, and I also saw someone tweeting, I have no clue if this is right, but I, I would be shocked if it's not. Arribas is probably the best player on this level in this division, don't you think? Um, goodness, I fortunately don't watch enough third division football to <laughs> say it definitively. But yeah, yeah he's definitely up there. Um, he's just so good. He, 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 I just think it's almost impossible to to play better at this level than than what he does. I think it'd be a very strange set of circumstances to find a player better than him at the moment. Yeah, that's the thing. And uh, he was, everyone agrees that he is ready for a higher level and uh, the club decided to keep him. But now I'm starting to think, because, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way that 
no matter how well a player does at Castilla, your expectations you can't have that high expectations for a Castilla player because we've seen so many good ones come into Castilla, deliver, and then they end up becoming maybe not even La Liga players. So I feel kind of the same with this group now, but also with Arribas, the way he's performing now. Do we think that he can actually become an important member of the first team squad for Real Madrid? Do you think that's... Something that we should realistically think about. Um. Oh, I don't know. It's I. It's um. It's rough, I guess. Um. I I guess uh, with Benzema being injured, potentially there would have been an opening somewhere there. I don't know. Mm. I think if the club, the midfield is stacked, the attack looks like. Carlo Ancelotti, as of the last couple of games since Benzema was injured, seems to have found answers without Benzema in attack. And yeah. I don't know. I just think if there was there's if there was an interest in including a rebus, I just think there would have it would have happened by now. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what. Yeah, that's the there's, thing. There's I do not, yeah, I just don't get why Ancelotti doesn't seem to be interested in a rebus at all. That must be some kind of a uh, <laughs> like um uh you know with Odegaard he was uh he was playing with um, with the the first team um just by principle maybe with Arribas it's the opposite that they've just decided that no he should just be playing with Castilla no matter how well he performs yeah. I I just don't get it Yeah well I like even Hazard and Essential on the bench are not in yeah. like not in Ancelotti plans. That's another set of players that Arebus has to go through before he's in the first team picture. Mm. Um, one thing, one thing that I, uh, one thing that could give um, hope for Arebus is that we have a lot of deep lying central midfielders like Kroos, Modric, Chouameni. They all like to to go deep and pick up the ball in deep areas. Uh, they don't have that many. Number tens, you know, even Valverde is a box to box, and uh, uh, yeah, Ceballos, I guess, could could play that role. But Arribas is he's a very creative attacking midfielder, and that is something that the team needs. So, yeah, it could maybe give us a little bit of hope, but as you say, the competition is so hard. Yeah, um, I suppose it stands to Arribas that he's not a traditional number 10. <laughs> Because yeah. uh, if that was the case, we'd be in serious trouble because I don't think the team's had a proper, like, that sort of role in a very long time. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, he can play on the wing and he can play a bit deeper. So uh, let's see what happens. But uh, the way he has started in the season, I'm thinking that maybe actually this is, maybe I should have Jesse expectations for him. Like, uh, when Jesse was delivering him, Segunda, and that was not the Segunda B, it was Segunda, the next, the second highest level of Spain. But at that time, I was super excited, and I thought this could be a star. And now I'm starting to think maybe I should start thinking the same way about Rebus, that uh, he could actually become, if not a star, at least an, a very important player for. Yeah, you can. Have- you can't ever really know for sure. Like I saw no. the assist that Miguel Gutierrez had for Hirona, yes. and I was just—it's again—it's like Oscar Rodriguez, um, <laughs> one of those players yeah. where you're like, "Oh, we knew he was capable of that," but I don't think we ever saw it um, when he yeah. was with Castilla. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it can go either way. I suppose the worst scenario for me is when a player is clearly better, good enough to move on and is still playing for us. That's always yeah. Uh, disconcerting. Yeah, it is. It is. But uh, it, uh, if we look at it in a positive way, at least he is not now playing at the Real Madrid the lead, sitting on the bench, not even on the on the bench, maybe in the stands. I mean, it could have been. Yeah. We sent him along to Dortmund, or you know, yeah. um, at least he's now playing and getting a lot of confidence. Uh, at the yeah, it's it's better than sitting on the bench, and who knows. Um, what happens to Kroos? What happens to Modric next season? Ceballos, if his contract is expiring, everyone could stay, but everyone could also end up leaving. Uh, out of yeah, yeah. Um, 
you never know, a decent move might also materialise in the winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the World Cup, you know, it's the uh, first time that I know that it's been a Winter World Cup, so maybe um, the January window will be extra active. But uh, we also scored a, another goal, five one. Five one is you know it's, it's crazy result. So that came from uh, the subs, uh, three subs involved in the goal. It was Obrador who was the kind of a scapegoat in um, one of the games. I don't remember which team, but uh, Ferrol maybe, and then. Um, he found Bruno Iglesias, another substitute, laid it back to Theo Sudan, who scored. If you haven't seen the goal, I think the best way to describe it is like a Tony Cross classic. Yeah. And, uh, just yeah. curled it into the uh, low corner perfectly, just calmly placed. Very nice. It's actually one of the better goals I've seen a score. Yeah. It was very kind of. Um... It was all one touch passing. No one had yes. more than one touch to finish it off. Mm. And yeah, Zidane definitely had a cross inspired finish. It always yes. reminds me of the snooker shots if anyone watches snooker. <laughs> Zidane is, it, it, Zidane is kind of a, not a, he's not a weird player, but you know, when he's not a typical Zidane. I think a lot of people in the all oh, have Zidane. Well, no, it's not Zidane. He's very tall, yeah. he's very strong, he, he's spot on when. Castilla maybe needs some aerial presence, for example, but it's yeah, he's, he's a decent technically as well, but he's not a typical sedan. No, uh, but I mean, that's been the case for most of his sons. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I guess. I, guess. Um, uh, I don't know. I think we have another one or two left to go. I'm not sure. I, can't I, I always forget who that last one is. Is it? Oh, I, I almost have I can't it. remember his name for the life of me. I almost have it. No, 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 that's not. Let's see, Dan. Dan. It's kind of going to get. Might be Elise or something like Yeah, Elias. that's it. Elias Juan Fernandez. So, what else is this? I think, isn't he one of the. Could he be the most similar to to Cindy Day? No, I haven't. I've not watched no, him. So he's left like... back. <laughs> he's left back. <laughs> yeah, so there we are. He's also 194 meters, so yeah, that's a tall guy. That's all we. That's that's the that's the last. Of the, he's our last hope. He's the last hope. It, it, but is he? Uh, do we know? Yeah, is he the last one? I think, I think he is the last one. Yeah, the five five kids. Five kids. Who's the fifth? Enzo, Luca, Theo, Elias. Uh. The, <laughs> that's the pub quiz question right there yes 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 which we're not probably going to get the answer for okay. oh no it's four sons not five whoops okay okay yeah well last hope let's see let's see but um yeah theo is a uh, good player to have in the squad and uh we have a lot of coverage so I just when I, I look at the players on bench now, um, yeah, we have a super squad and uh, no excuses for for um, we should definitely deliver a good season. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's good. I mean, it's funny how things can change in two games. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm not saying that it will happen or that you know uh, now that everything we won a couple of games that everything is perfect, but. Uh, it's. I still think. I still said the, the same thing at the start of the season with the current group of players. I. I, I think Raúl should be able to, to to create some good results. And actually, the last time except we were fourth in the table, it could have been. Um, could have changed now. Yeah. But um. Uh, because the the table is kind of messy. A lot of people. A lot of teams are have played. Uh, different amounts of games, but yeah, we're fifth now. Uh, so that's a yeah, decent start to the season actually. After yeah, the last two decent wins. turnaround. Yeah, yeah, yeah decent turnaround. Um, the Fatigo can go past us. They have the uh, game in hand, but um, yeah, that's uh, it's, it's good for us. And um, I mean, I uh, I I think this this win should give the team a lot of confidence. Remember how much we've talked about it every season. How much the team struggles away from home, 
and this was an away game, Taiwan against San Sebastian, your uh, um, least favorite team. Um, yeah, they they got rid of the running track, or they weren't yeah. playing on the same pitch anyway, so I was glad to see that was gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, away win, Taiwan, a lot of goals, not the, the worst defensive performance. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of positives, obviously, from a Taiwan win. Yeah, no, you can't have any complaints. Um, no, no, no. Especially because I thought I did think that San Sebastian would be a more difficult opponent than they have they transpired to be. Yeah, they usually yeah. give us a lot of trouble, hence why I don't yeah. like them. Yes. Um. Um. One bad uh, story is that Aranda I heard was sitting in the stands with crutches, so he seems to be out for a while. Um. Alvaro Rodriguez, I don't know how how his um, his status, but he had to he couldn't play either. But um, and Pablo Ramon had to go out with an injury. Uh, apart from that, I think we are good. We got Carlos Gator back, uh, important for us. And um, Mario De Luis keeps uh, playing a goal ahead of Camisares. That's uh, something that um, uh, I didn't expect after the first couple of games, but. Um, yeah, do you think Raul will keep changing the goalkeepers, or do you think he's now set on? It's not. The least? It's not usually a. It hasn't been a feature of his management. He usually picks a goalkeeper and sticks to him. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, it's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, one thing that I need to mention about Raul is that uh, in the 87th minute we were four one up. And Raul was just jumping and screaming for the team to defend better. And just three minutes to go, 4-1 up. That's a lot about uh, Raul's style. Yeah. And <laughs> I was also reminded about this discussion we've had a few times. That when Raul arrived at Katia, he, you know, there were reports about him taking away the players' phones and saying, ah, you, can, you shouldn't dress like that and, you know, no jewelry and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I remember I was a bit worried that, okay, maybe this style will put the players in the short run, but will it, will it maybe make the players tired in the long run? We haven't heard any stories uh, about players disliking him. He's uh, going to support the season now. And um, yeah, it seems like um, despite his demands, high demands, the players respect him and still love him i think yeah for sure um i suppose like the intense style of play can be difficult to balance sometimes but uh yeah i don't think in terms of like respect among in the dressing room he's lacking in any no so i mean if he can start uh, getting great results as well i mean that's um he will have a fantastic platform for for replacing Ancelotti, if that time comes in the near future, as uh, you know, when we're looking at um, how the first team is performing, I mean, it's, uh, it's not looking great. For yeah, I was about to say, it sounds like it's going to be more so on Ancelotti's terms than anybody else. Yes, exactly. And uh, I know that Real Madrid always. Um, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm actually not going to, I'm not going to draw any conclusions right now because I remember the last time Ancelotti was at Real Madrid. He won La Decima per season, the same, uh, same time he won the Copa del Rey, with that uh, brilliant Bale goal in you know, a classical final, fantastic season. Um, next season, we win 22 games in a row, 22 games in a row, and he still ends up getting fired at the end of the season. Yes, yeah. he didn't get any trophies, important trophies, but I mean, Cecil went the club couldn't even see that, you know, okay, 22 games in a row. That means that at least during the spell, he showed, he showed that he could, he could do yeah. it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it does, it's playing in the back of my mind as well, but I think it's a, it's a very different team compared to the one that he had in 2014-15. It's a very different team, but uh, um, do you think, uh, I mean... Difficult to win the Champions League two times in a row, even though we've done it before. But uh, mm. let's just assume that we don't win for the second time in a row. 
And let's also say that Barcelona, who looks strong, end up winning the league title. Does Caron so to continue? And is that maybe the opportunity for Raul if if he answer doesn't continue? Um, yeah, I mean it. It's so I don't. It's um. I think it's definitely in the. Uh, that's the idea, anyways. That's the plan, and it's a similar thing with Arbeloa, um, working his mm. way through the ranks as well. It's always in the plan. It's the profile of coach that the club thinks works best at the top level for us. Uh, but yeah, um, it, it it I it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, yeah, it is. No, I I uh, I just think things change so much so fast in football. For example, Thomas Tuchel one year ago, ah, oh, the best manager. Oh, everyone was hyping him up, and oh, he's so good. And how can not how can he not be at Real Madrid? Oh, we have this old Everton manager. <laughs> this was uh, what people were saying. Now, is uh, Tuchel is uh, fired for that club? Ancelotti. La Liga winner, Champions League winner, won every single game. I mean, things can change. But um, one thing that I realized is that, you know, there's not a lot of managers out there that we want. Uh, Pochettino, who knows what. What do we think about him now after leaving? Yeah, this is it. This is what I was thinking. I was thinking it always depends on who's on the manager market. It all comes to all. But... uh, yeah, there's not really a lot of managers at the moment that have a kind of high stock price. I think Pochettino certainly is his um, the interest at a top level has really uh, simmered down recently. I suppose Val- Ernesto Valverde was probably the big yeah. name there for a few years, but he's at mm. like a big bow again. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if Tuchel will ever be. I don't know if Tuchel's the sort of coach they'll consider. No, at Real Madrid. Could be, could be, but uh, um, I mean, it's so difficult to predict. The only thing I know is that there's not a lot of options. So yeah. I do think Raul has a good chance still. But do you think if Ancelotti wins the league, for example, and gets its third season, um, do you think Raul will go into another season with Castilla, or is this definitely his last one? Um, well, like, nothing is certain until the fat lady sings. I don't see the advantage in going to a fifth year with Castilla, I think. (laughs) Unless something dramatic happens and he gets the opportunity to coach at the second level. Yeah. Um, you know, that, in that case, sure. But, I mean, I think if he can fulfill the potential this team has, we're going to have a good year. Even mm. if even if that good year might end up with us falling short. Mm. And I think in that circumstance they'll definitely be peop they'll definitely be suitors for Raul. Yeah. And um yeah. I think having passed up on the opportunity two two years ago, I don't think he'll do it again. I think he'll look to move on. Yeah. I agree. But I do think it's a I do think it's an intelligent move by Raul to stay at the sea. I don't think, you know, I don't think it hinders his career that much. I mean, he he delays it a little bit. But, I mean, four years at Castilla and um, with some decent results and, uh, you know, the players have liked him. And it's not like a player. It's not like Ariba staying for four years. Raul can stay for four years without problem, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I I would also say in a similar way that you'll see players at Castilla and think they'll actually be better suited for a top level. I think Raul's um, coaching style and the way he likes to have his teams approach the game is would be more successful at a top level than it would be down here. Yeah, could be, could be. I agree. Um... I'm not sure if there's more to take. I, well, there are. There's a lot of things to talk about in this game, but it's difficult to to yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there's one thing I wanna um, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about this Vinicius uh, racism and stuff. Yeah, um, I, I thought that might come up. Uh, and not. Um, I mean, I know the racism, the racism stuff has been covered 
on the podcast already. But uh, one thing that I, I think a lot of people have forgotten about, and this is a very good, uh, this has a lot of relevance to Castilla, because when Vinicius played for Castilla, his first game against the Atletico Reserves, do you remember what happened? He got bitten in the head. Yes, he got bitten in the head by an Atletico. I think the Atletico captain at that time. Yeah, for yeah. The team. And uh, I mean, that's just, <laughs> what's, what's the deal with Atletico and Vinicius? I mean, he's just... Um, yeah, but it's yeah. like, it's not just Vinicius, because um, I know during the quarterfinals of the UEFA Youth League last season, we played Atletico Madrid and Peter was... Peter Federico was racially abused. You know, that's very good that you bring up this point because I was actually at that game. I was actually at that game. Um, yeah. The under-19s, um, under Atletico under-19s. And that was a uh, crazy game because we went there and um, we were four Norwegians and um, one of the... Um, we were three people from the Pena and uh, one of the dads were going with and uh, you know he didn't know that much about Real Madrid so we wanted to we hope that uh, after the second would show its good side but it it was evident that a lot of Atletico fans had gotten into the crowd so it was much more Atletico songs and everything in the crowd yeah. and um, then we we actually didn't know didn't notice the, um, this uh, racism uh, in that game but is it Frente, Frente Atletico or something? Yeah, Frente Atletico, it? yeah. They were at the game and uh, oof, you could just see they were standing on the other side. And uh, I don't think they are actually allowed at Atletico's games. I've found out afterwards. They aren't, no. Um, and I don't think they'd be allowed in the Bernabeu, but it was a case no. of, um, it was, I think it was kind of grossly mismanaged by um, the kind of youth department at Madrid not to, to, have not stamped or not to have prepared for this sort of thing because um, yeah. I know that the police escorted the Frente Atletico fans to the Val de Bebas that ah. day. So, I what? mean, there was enough, yeah, there was enough foresight in that to ensure there was a police presence for that game. Really? I think really? that Madrid would uh, be aware. Um, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, just to be aware that a sort of incident like this could happen and to ensure yeah. that it's not happening inside the stadium. Mm. Because the only thing I saw was a group of crazy fans who were singing and they were, I thought, they are taking this under 19 game very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, seriously than us. Yeah, that's the... Um, and that's kind of the... People play devil's advocate and say that, you know, having banned the ultrasaurs, the club has lost a bit of an atmosphere yada 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 but um i don't know i don't think it's yeah. worth it's not worth the um abuse that comes with it that you trade off with it just to have more of an atmosphere i think uh particularly in madrid's in madrid's case specifically i think they did great work in terms of getting that white wall on the south side yeah yeah i think those guys bring definitely bring the bring the yes. atmosphere up, ranch it up. And at away games as well, I think they're very good at away games. Yes. Um, yeah. They took over the second half last night. Yeah, I mean, when real fans are known to be a bit quiet at times, but if you have crazy supporters, yeah, you will have crazy... Yeah. Um, yeah. You will have... The, yeah, they will be crazy in a lot of ways. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that in this under-19 game, it was Fernando Torres who was um, their coach. And he was applauding them, and I mean, just uh, thanking them, and they were, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's it's definitely, I mean, it's not just the Latco Madrid. I think we should make that much clear. I, um, I think Carvajal's been accused of racism. Diego Aspas um, has been accused of it as well. I know, um, I had a name of a club as well, where it was a Real or someone like that. There has been, it's epidemic. I know Dan, it was yeah. that Dani Alves got a banana thrown at him at one match yeah, against Villarreal or Eibar. So it's epidemic in Spain. Um, yes, it is. And, and it needs to be addressed. It, just, it, to, it seems like they tried to hide it, then they just, uh, yeah. Yeah, I now, don't. Madrid banned the ultras, there, obviously. So, I mean, Barcelona banned their ultras group as well. Yeah. Um, but I think, 
I think that's just... did, if you if you're correct, they did ban this group as well. Yeah, but I like I think clubs just kind of it being left up to the clubs to just ban them if they feel like it or not ban them if they don't feel like it is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I think La Liga and the Spanish Football Federation need to take a more active role in addressing it. You know, when this uh, we were at the stadium and this uh, Trent Atleti were singing against Peter Federico and, you know, there was the M19 game and everything, yeah. I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know that they were, they got, you know, helped to the stadium by the police and everything. So, <laughs> One of the, um, you know, the guy I was sitting next to, another Norwegian, he was uh, trying to get me to sing. <laughs> and he actually, he said, okay, if you, if you sing this song, I will pay you the dinner the day after. <laughs> and I actually started singing, you know, this song, Joraron in Lisboa, Joraron yeah. in Milan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's you know, they, they cried in this world, they cried in the lines. I started singing that song very loud, loudly <laughs> just because it was fun. And when I look back at it now, that was not a smart move. That was not, I think they could have <laughs> attacked me if they had recognized me afterwards. So, um, yeah, luckily they didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hope it was a good dinner. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think it was a decent <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, at least we survived. And um, yeah, but uh, I'm saying that this stuff happens. Um, at least, uh, I mean, I think it was good. Um, how can I say it? Um, just um, after everything that happened, the whole world of football seemed to get around Vinicius and this uh, by love and Isis, um, hashtag yeah. and uh, so many players, so many clubs you know, to support him and such a beautiful moment when another ex player, Castilla player Rodrigo, scored, danced with Vinicius and uh, a lot of great pictures from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there was certainly a I don't like I, I especially in the first half as well after we'd scored the first goal there was um an energy and motivation to the team <laughs> I think they clearly they were clearly out to make a statement um yeah which I mean I I respect but it's going to need a bit more than just a statement for, a statement on the pitch to yeah. address this sort of situation stop it from happening again Well, what's um, what's next? Do we have anything else? What's the next game? No, uh, I have to double check. I, you know what? I do this every week. I should really have learned my lesson by this stage. Yeah, we are we are playing against the uh, Barajos. Barajos. Uh. Sunday at um, twelve my time. Um, I like those kickoffs, but um, yeah. How those they are? Where are they in the table? They are twelfth. Yeah. Well, let's see if they can get their third win in a row. Would be very nice. It's uh, yeah. Those sort of, that sort of like run of form doesn't really happen for Castilla very often. Usually it's um no. kind of two wins or one win and then a mm. loss. So uh, three wins in a row would certainly be a statement. You wouldn't put it past yeah. them at home early kickoff. Usually those yeah. games go well. Ah yes. Ah, I'm looking forward to it already. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right then, until then, we are going to just, we're going to sit at our laptops and we're going to just wait until we get to the <laughs> yes. report button again. We're not going to speak Nothing to each else. other. No, we're yeah, not going to do okay. anything else. We're not even going to eat. No. <laughs> we'll try not to breathe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hold our breath until then. Yeah. Right. Thank you again for joining me, Ruben. Uh, yes, thank thanks you. for doing most of the talking, I think, because I, I, didn't have, I couldn't add much in this one because I didn't watch the game. But uh, hopefully I'll be a bit more informed next week. Hopefully uh, Sam Sharp will be on the ball. He'll be ready. Yeah, star man, <laughs> star player. He's making progress today. We, we've, yeah. we mentioned off air that he is beginning to make progress. He's slowly moving towards a possible pod appearance. So... All, a player all can we across. compare him to? A player who maybe is often injured, but uh, 
Ah, but it's not good enough when he's on the pitch. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, player who is like a crazy injured, but also crazy good when he's um, he's on the pitch. Like um, Falcao, I don't know. Falcao, well, yeah. Mm. He's not been injured much in recent history, but I remember back in his peak, he used to get like awful injuries with Monaco and that. It's quite, and but every time he played, he just he was incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we should have so many players to to choose from here. People must be screaming out names when they. <laughs> but uh, injured player also great. Well, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of them too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> comment on the. Yeah, Good give us, let us know, team. let us know what player, <laughs> the player equivalent of Sam Sharp. Is. Sam Sharp is what player, yeah. <laughs> until, all right, until next week, Hala Madrid. All right, before we wrap it up here and send you guys along on your way, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid who do so much to support the show and they also get a ton of bonus content. If that's something you're interested in and being part of a bigger Real Madrid family, again, go to patreon.com slash managing Madrid. And we wanted to give a specific shout out to our $10 plus patrons because if you pledge $10 or more per month, you get a specific shout out on the podcast as well as guaranteed responses to your questions. So... Shout out to Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Wei Pering, Will Sousa, Wamik Jamal, Umar Mahadi, Tyler Dixon, Tobias Royal Botcher, Tark Goktas, Taleb Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Sumanchu Singh, Sherry Soriel, Sheikh Hatiri, Shamil Shabal Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorsano, Samuel Justin, Samir Z. Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Adayafadi, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicolas Zapatero Zubiare, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, MJ Diego, Mowgli, uh, Nelson Masariego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lex, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jeff Thurston, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Cohut, Frederick Antakiro, Frederick Sundros, Faisal Hamdan, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Khan P., Christian Toth, Christian Acosta, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Bashar, Armin Gashi, Armando L., Antons Rudenko, Anirut Singh, Ananya Kumar, Alex Steiberg, Al Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Varun, Ramtin, Magrur, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. We love you guys so much. Thank you so much. Hala Madrid, and we'll see you on the post-game podcast after the Atlantic game.